Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for a time to gather, to settle our hearts before you, and to hear from heaven, to have your Holy Spirit speak to our spirit, to have your Holy Spirit speak life to our spirit, to do something deep in the core of who we are, and that we would see that worked out, that the watching world as they wonder about all of this, would see us as living epistles and that would segue to you, Jesus, that they would see you, they would consider you. Lord, we want to be found faithful, faithful representatives of your nature, your character, your love. We want to know you and reflect you. We want to be a conduit for your love and for your grace, for your mercy. We love you, Lord. We commit this time of Bible study to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so tonight we continue our verse-by-verse study of 1 Corinthians. Last week we looked at verses 1 through 19 of chapter 15. This week we're going to look at verses 20 through 34 of chapter 15. And next week we'll look at verses 35 through 58 of chapter 15. And then the week after that, chapter 16, and we're done. So just a few studies left in 1 Corinthians. So uh, let's review what we went through last week. We'll read through and review And then uh, we'll go on from there. So read through and review verses 1 through 19 of chapter 15. So verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast to that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas and then by the Twelve, and after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles, and then last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due time. I am the last of the least of the apostles, who am not even worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. So here's Paul reiterating the simple gospel. Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And after he rose from the dead, he was seen by a whole lot of people. He was seen by Peter and then the 12 apostles and then 500 all at once. And then James, and then all the apostles again, and then last of all, as uh, one born out of due time, Paul himself. And yet the Corinthians, he's about to address this in a moment, um, overcomplicated a core component of the gospel. They contradicted a core component of the gospel. And the core component of the gospel that they overcomplicated and contradicted was the resurrection. There were some in Corinth saying that there was no resurrection, which was the reason why he needed to reiterate the gospel. And now he asks a simple question after he reiterates the simple gospel. In verse 12, he says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now we've seen all the way through the first, uh, all the way through the chapters in 1 Corinthians that the Corinthian church was a carnal church. There were some carnal people who called themselves Christians who publicly questioned the resurrection, and not in a humble search for truth kind of way, but in a subversive, sinful sort of way. They were not just a carnal church, but a conflicted church, conflicted because of their carnality, because of their immaturity, because of their insecurity, because of their lack of commitment to the simplicity of the gospel. And so in addition to all that he's been said, that all he's said so far, remember, moreover, in addition to all that's been said, Pastor Paul chose again to preach the simple gospel, to go over the core components of the simple gospel, and one of them being the resurrection. And then after he declares the resurrection, he lays out a line of reasoning concerning the resurrection that seems to be unarguable. And he does that in verses 12 through 19. So now look at verses 12 through 19. 
chapter 15. Now, if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found to be false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if, in fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is is futile and you're still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. So in that last verse, Paul makes a stunning statement. He's saying if there is only hope in Christ, only in this life, then we who claim to be Christians are of all men the most pitiable. Idiable. We're to be pitied <laughs> more than all men. We're fools for doing what we do. And remember, last week we read a number of translations that helped us to understand what he was saying. One of them said, If we have put our hope in Christ for only this life, we should be pitied more than anyone. Another one said, If all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for a few short years, we are pretty, a pretty sorry lot. Another one says, and if being a Christian is of value to us only now in this life, we are the most miserable of creatures. And another one says, truly, if our hope in Christ were limited to this life only, we should, of all mankind, be the most pitied. And yet we know the whole point to having hope in Christ is to look past this life because Christ defeated not only sin, but the enemy called death as well. And that's what Paul is going to talk about now as 1 Corinthians 15 continues. He's going to talk about how death is a defeated foe. And one day, death will not only be defeated, but death will also be completely destroyed and removed. So look with me now at verses 20 through 28 of 1 Corinthians 15. So verses 20 through 28. Verse 20 says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. Okay, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it's evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now, when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Okay, so death is an enemy. And death as an enemy has already been defeated One day, death as an enemy will be destroyed. One day, death as an enemy will be removed. One day, death as an enemy will be no more. And until that day, death is still an enemy. See, Jesus hates death. He hates what death does in separating families and separating loved ones. And Jesus came to do something about death, to defeat death. In John chapter 11, there's an interesting interaction between Jesus and Martha and Mary concerning Lazarus. Lazarus was Martha and Mary's brother. Lazarus was Jesus' good friend. And one day, Lazarus got really, really sick. And so Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus and said, your friend is sick. 
And for reasons that Jesus had, he did not respond to the message right away. He didn't leave right away. He waited a couple of days, long enough for Lazarus to die. And by the time that Jesus arrived, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, dead for four days. And so as Jesus arrived, Martha went to Jesus and Mary went to Jesus and they separately poured out their hearts to Jesus. And Martha was mad. And Mary was really, really sad. And Jesus was both. Jesus experienced both of those emotions. In that chapter, it says that Jesus wept. And then a little later, it says that Jesus was very angry. Now, what was Jesus angry with? Who was Jesus angry with? He was angry at the enemy called death. And Jesus didn't come to just get emotional about death. He didn't come to just give hope for this life without a resurrection into the next. Jesus came to lay down his life, to die. Think of this, to enter the grave, to enter death. And then from the grave, from death, defeat death. I mean, what could be more amazing than that? And why would the Corinthian Christians or some of the Corinthian Christians question that? Well, this is what we've seen in the Corinthian church all along. Some of the Corinthian Christians were carnal Christians. And as carnal Christians, following the flesh instead of following the Spirit, in their insecurity, in their immaturity, in their desire to say, look at me, look at me, they were willing to contradict a core, non-negotiable component of the simple gospel in a selfish attempt to seem more spiritual than their brothers or sisters, to somehow seem more learned or more wise. And Pastor Paul is about to say, Stay away from these guys. In verse 29 through 34, look at this, verses 29 through 34. Verse 29 says, Otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead do not rise at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? Why do we stand in jeopardy every hour? I affirm by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. And if in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? I mean, if the dead do not rise, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Verse 33, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So what Paul's doing here is something that we don't talk about very often. We don't talk about all that often, all of the times in the Scriptures, that it warns us as believers to separate from certain people. In the Scriptures, several times, we're warned to stay away or to separate from People who claim to be Christians, claim to be following the Holy Spirit, but who lack the fruit of the Spirit and instead consistently display the works of the flesh. This is, this is something that we've seen throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, something we've talked about in several of our studies. The fruit of the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. Someone can claim to be a Christian and claim to be following the Spirit, but if they're only exhibiting the works of the flesh, something's wrong. And the Bible doesn't tell us to stay away from unbelievers, people who are honest and unregenerate, to expect an unregenerate person who hasn't been born again to follow the Lord in obedience. It doesn't work. It's not logical. However, when someone claims to be a believer but continually displays the works of the flesh, the Bible over and over warns us to be wary of that person. So here's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, virtue, faith, gentleness, strength of spirit, self-control. And then here's the works of the flesh. Manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums. 
angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions. And there were several Corinthians who would find themselves squarely within that last list. And Pastor Paul is saying boldly, be wary of these guys. Be careful of these guys. Listen, bad company corrupts good habits. You need to be wary of these guys and separate from those who claim to be following the Holy Spirit but who consistently display the works of the flesh. And Scripture says this several times. We just don't talk about it all that much. Here's one time. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Remember, we're not to be separate from unbelievers. We're to be separate from those who claim to be believers but who consistently display the works of the flesh. So this list is concerning those who claim to be believers. Mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here's Titus chapter 3. Warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful. They are self-condemned. That's Titus chapter 3. Here's Romans chapter 16. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Keep away from them. And these are tough truths, aren't they? And it's what we must wrestle with. And Pastor Paul is warning the Corinthian church, there are some among you who claim to be Christians but follow the flesh, and it's evident, and you'll know them by their fruit. The fruit of following the Spirit or the fruit of following your flesh? Now, if all you see is the fruit of following your flesh, then just be honest. Either you're in a really bad place or you've never been born again. That's not awful to say that. It's honest to say that. And that's how I came to be a Christian, because I was not a genuine Christian. I was going to church every Sunday. I was going to Bible study every Wednesday. I was trying subconsciously to rescue my girlfriend from these ignorant, idiot, fundamentalist Christians, all the while saying I'm a Christian, but walking in the works of the flesh. And a friend loved me enough to say, either something's really wrong or you've never been born again. And I got mad. I got defensive. I started going down this list. (laughs) Hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions. All of it was there. Why? I had not been born again. I was following my flesh, and I was not following the Spirit. I'm so thankful that somebody loved me enough to say those things to me. Pastor Paul loved the Corinthian church enough to say, evil company corrupts good habits. Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Awake to righteousness and do not sin. For some do not have the knowledge of God. And I speak this to your shame. So, Lord, here we are tonight, and we only individually can say to you, search me and know me. See if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Lord, if it's been a season of following my emotions or following my flesh, instead of submitting to you and following after your spirit. Reveal that to me and rescue me from that so that I might eventually see the fruit of the spirit, that I might be a blessing to my brothers and sisters instead of a hindrance. 
instead of somebody to be warned about. Oh, Lord, the goodness and severity of God. We stand before you, a holy God, and we're so thankful that you love us. Your thoughts towards us are good. We're so thankful that you tell us the truth and that you lead us in that way everlasting. Lord, go before us tonight as we continue to glorify you and serve each other. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.